Good afternoon, everybody. I'm instructed to get us off to a prompt start to ensure that we've got plenty of time to discuss the fascinating uh, papers that we are about to hear. So uh, let me begin by introducing myself. I'm Adrian Stone from Melbourne Law School, and it'll be my pleasure to chair this plenary session. I want to begin by acknowledging that we meet on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, an especially important um, acknowledgement uh, to make, given that we are meeting now to speak about public law and Indigenous peoples, so I pay my respects to their elders past and present. It is my pleasure to introduce the three speakers that we'll be hearing on this theme, and I'll do so relatively briefly and all at once, so I won't pop up and introduce them in, bet uh, in between the time each of them has to speak. We're first um, delighted that uh, we'll uh, be hearing from uh, Jill Ga Gallagher. Uh, Jill Gala is a Gunjit Mara woman from Western Victoria and she has worked and been a leader within the Victorian Aboriginal community for all of her life and she is now the Commissioner of the Treaty Advancement Commission. After Jill, we will hear from Professor Kirsty Gover, who is my colleague here at Melbourne Law School and who is well known for her work on law policy and the political theory of Indigenous rights, institutions and jurisdiction. And then, lastly, we're very honoured to be joined by the Honourable Justice Matthew Palmer of the High Court of New Zealand, who, as you will all know, um, is a new, one of New Zealand's leading public law experts, um, including a ac distinguished academic career before his judicial appointment. Okay, so now I think I'll welcome Jill Gallagher. Thank you, Jill. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I also would like to acknowledge that I am on Aboriginal land and uh, the land of the Kulin Nations, the traditional owners of the land in which we meet. I wish to pay my respects to elders, elders their elders uh, past and present and elders that may be here today. I'd like to thank Professor Stone and Melbourne University for hosting as introduced, I'm a proud Gunditjmara woman from Western Victoria. At the start of this year, I was appointed Victoria's first Treaty Advancement Commission, Commissioner. What I want to do is tell you a little bit about Aboriginal history, our shared history, and then I'll tell you a little bit about my role and what I'm supposed to do. We all know that Victoria was occupied prior to colonisation. It's not a myth, it's a fact. Our communities had and still have very complex social structures and our own law that governed our ways of life. Our people knew how to use the environment for our survival. We knew our country. We knew about fire farming and fish farming methods. We knew how to look after the land because it was important to do that so that the land would look after us for generations to come. Our people walked this country when there was a land bridge between Tasmania and the mainland. Our people witnessed volcanoes erupting, the last one in uh, Western Victoria, my country, Warrnambool, Tower Hill. Our people hunted megafauna and survived. Megafauna died out many, many thousands of years ago in this country. But our community still survived and we lived on and we grew and we prospered. But then something catastrophic happened to us. For Aboriginal people, for Aboriginal people and communities in Victoria, colonisation was brutal and had unquantifiable devastating impacts on us as a people, and it still does today. 
the introduction of diseases, massacres, theft, forced relocation of our people off their traditional countries, and generations of Aboriginal children stolen. This all had an incredible impact on us as a culture and a community. But despite all this, we remain a strong and proud people. Our communities continue to grow and make great strides. But there is unfinished business in this country. I'm not sure whether you're aware, I'm hoping you all do, but Australia is one of the only Commonwealth countries that does not have a treaty with Indigenous peoples of this country. Aboriginal Australia, Aboriginal Australians, we have never ceded our sovereignty and have long called for treaty with government. There was a treaty negotiated back in 1835 when John Batman signed a treaty with the local Kulin clan elders trading 600,000 acres of land for some blankets and some trinkets and an annual tribute. The treaty was annulled a few months later and in the, wrong, in the long run, in hindsight, it was probably a good thing as it was a as it was a rotten deal for the local Aboriginal communities. But what that tells us is that even as early as 1835, the authorities recognised that terra nullius was a myth, that there were a sovereign people that lived in this country, that cultivated the land, So the call for treaty isn't new, but what is new is that Victorian government has heeded this call. In early 2016, government held a self-determination forum, asking community what it means to us. What would self-determination look like? The overwhelming call at that forum was that we need treaty with government. The first stage in the process for us was working out how this is going to happen. Because of that devastating impacts of colonisation, our culture, our communities, our traditional owner groups, our clans copped a big smacking. It almost crushed us. And when the missions were set up to save the blackfellas, in inverted commas, what it did was denied our people the rights, basic human rights, to, uh, to education, to employment, to economic development, and to our culture. It tried to sever our connection to our country and our culture. So the first stages for us was how, if the government is now prepared to explore what a state-based treaty could look like, how are we as a community going to organise ourselves? Who negotiates treaties? What's on the table, what's off the table? So a working group was established back in 2016. It consisted of 16 Aboriginal people from across the state of Victoria. And our role was to assist the government to work out how do we go forward with a treaty or treaties in this state. The working group worked on a number of things. The establishment of the Treaty Advancement Commission and Commissioner, 
It worked on developing, uh, in partnership with state government, worked on developing the, um, the bill, the Treaty Advancement Bill, which is now an act of parliament. My role is not to negotiate treaties. Because I think that's a fair way off. My responsibility is to establish an Aboriginal representative body. The representative body will be a democratic voice for our people in the treaty process, independent of government. The representative body will work with government to establish a treaty negotiating framework which sets out the groundwork for treaties, including what is on the table and who can negotiate treaties. Secondly, establish a treaty authority, which will be independent, which will be the independent umpire in the process. Thirdly, it will establish a self-determination fund, which will support Aboriginal communities to be on an even playing field <coughs> with government. A lot of thinking around this structure has been informed by modern treaties, modern treaty making such as the British Columbia models. Government has shown their commitment to this process in legislation passed by parliament last month. The act for the first time in Australia ever commits the government to a treaty process with Aboriginal Victorians and ensures it is done fairly. Treaty is about, uh, I believe treaties are fundamental to protecting the interests of Aboriginal people. It recognises us as a sovereign peoples. It also it is about acknowledging the land was taken from us and resetting our relationship with the state. At this stage, we don't know, and I'm not prepared to speculate what will be in treaties in Victoria. But as far as I'm concerned, everything's on the table. But I must add, everything but private land, <laughs> just in case people get scared. <laughs> Everything that's within a state government remit, that is and local government remit. <laughs> Treaties can also be about truth-telling. It has to be about land, about education. It all, it's also an opportunity for us to share our culture. We have 80,000 years on this country. We have an ancient, rich and contemporary culture. I want to see a world where it's taught in schools, where you see it in the landscape, where you see Aboriginal culture, you walk around Melbourne University, where you see Aboriginal culture if you're in the heart of the city. We are not visible on the landscape and a treaty can change that. Our languages and our politics. We still have a long way to go and the challenges are immense. However, we are further than ever, than ever we have ever been before on the road to treaties here in Victoria and I'm immensely proud of that fact. So thank you very much.
Kia ora tato. I would also like to acknowledge that we're meeting today on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders. I propose at Jason's suggestion to um, reflect on the 2017 Uluru Statement from the Heart to show how this statement and its proposal sit with other distinctive features of Australian's Indigenous public law, that is, the public law that structures the state-Indigenous relationship. And I'd like to make some observations about how the Uluru Statement's proposals um, align with public law mechanisms in our peer states, in the settler state, Commonwealth, fraternity, especially Canada and New Zealand. My major claim, as will soon become clear, is that seen in these contexts, the, product, the pro proposals are modest, they are reasonable, and especially given the Australian context, they are vitally necessary. In particular, I want to draw attention to the potential of the Uluru proposals to go some way to remedying what I see as a major and striking deficit in Australian public law, the ab absence of a duty on governments to consult Indigenous peoples before making decisions that directly impact on their interests. So first, what is the Uluru Statement? The Uluru Statement from the Heart was authored and endorsed by Indigenous leaders in May last year at an Indigenous constitutional convention held at Uluru, also known as Ayers Rock, uh, a sacred site on Pitanjaran land in the Western Desert near Alice Springs. The statement is brief, it's just one page in length, and the language used is forthright, urgent, and decidedly non-legal. Its opening passages reference the at least 60,000 years of Indigenous sovereignty in Australia, an ancient sovereignty, the statement explains, that is essentially a spiritual concept predicated on ancestral ties between land and people. Via the proposal set out in the statement, the authors, and I'll quote here for a fidelity, seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. These reforms are firstly, and I'm quoting again, the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution, and secondly, a Makarata Commission to oversee a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth telling about our history. I want to emphasise that the detail of these proposals is of course yet to be worked out, but the Referendum Council, an Indigenous body tasked with making recommendations to government, has proposed that the voice take the form of a representative body that gives First Nations a voice to the Commonwealth Parliament and whose specific functions will be set out in legislation. The statement is currently being considered along with the Referendum Council's other recommendations and other proposals for constitutional change by a joint parliamentary select committee. And the committee is scheduled to deliver its recommendations at the end of this month. Since those recommendations would need to be first endorsed by the federal parliament and then put to the electorate by referendum, they must, according to the committee's mandate, be capable of being supported by an overwhelming majority of Australians from across the political and social spectrums. The first substantive point I'd like to emphasise is that both the deliberate process leading to the convention in Uluru and the degree of consensus obtained at Uluru are unprecedented and uh, exceptional. They are in fact compelling. The statement is the culmination of 13 regional dialogues in which 1,200 Indigenous leaders took part and then at Uluru of 250 delegates in attendance, 243 endorsed the statement. And this I think is self-evidently remarkable in itself given the diversity of Indigenous peoples here on this huge continent. The peoples represented at Uluru live in the full range of rural and urban settings from cities to very remote uh, communities in hundreds of different traditional language and kinship groups. They live in accordance with a huge variety of traditions and legal systems. And of course, they have widely varied political views and aspirations. The conclusion of the Uluru Statement is truly, as my colleague Cheryl Saunders has persuasively argued, a constitutional moment in Australia's history. However, five months after the Uluru Convention, Prime Minister Turnbull issued a statement on behalf of his government rejecting the core proposal of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, saying, and here I quote again, 
Our democracy is built on the foundations of all Australian citizens having equal civic rights. A constitutionally enshrined additional representative assembly for which only Indigenous Australians could vote for or serve in is inconsistent with this fundamental principle. And I draw attention to our Prime Minister's statement here because it's illustrative of a much broader assumption or concern which animates public law responses to Indigenous claims in the liberal democracies. And it seems, to me at least, to be much more acutely present here in Australia than it is in our peer states. And that is that a distinctive relationship between Australian governments and Australian Indigenous peoples is presumptively at odds with equality and non-discrimination norms. The Prime Minister's concerns are an expression of a very long-standing tension in the settler liberal democracies between the historic collective rights of Indigenous peoples and the human rights that vest in us all. Uh, by historic collective rights, I mean those rights claimed by Indigenous peoples that almost by definition can only be held by Indigenous peoples or individuals, and they typically include rights to historic property, to authority, couched as self-determination or sovereignty, and to further distinctive relational rights and duties that would flow from the proper acknowledgement of those foundational entitlements. And these include rights to participate in the work of public institutions and, of course, the right to be consulted about decisions made by those institutions that impact on Indigenous interests. The deep problem, as always, lies in the different justificatory bases of Indigenous rights on the one hand and the broader category of human rights on the other. Historic Indigenous rights are not claims to an equitable share of primary goods on terms equal to those of other individuals. They're claims to particular property and powers, those that were held by the predecessors of Indigenous communities and should have been inherited by them. And these rights are not necessarily, or as a matter of principle, capped by concepts of distributive justice, equality and non-discrimination, at least in their orthodox forms. They depend on their justification on the existence of indigenous arrangements of power, property and law that preceded the establishment of the settler states. And they propose, I think, a counterfactual modelling of what a just society might have looked like had those arrangements been unviable and only changes to them that had been cons consented to would be considered legitimate. In other words, what is sought is the distribution of primary goods in accordance with a hypothetically just consensual agreement between Indigenous and settler peoples and their respective governments. Certain Indigenous rights, then, if you like, have a justificatory base that is premised as much on continuity as it is on ideas of equality, and this makes them very difficult to shoehorn into prospective liberal human rights frameworks, even in the best of circumstances. Here in Australia, the difficulty is much exaggerated by some features of our public law. The first is that in Australia, the state indigenous relationship is to a very large extent structured by legal concepts of race and of racial discrimination. And formally, I think this is enabled and perhaps engendered by the absence of a federal constitutional or legislative bill of rights, which could, for example, include positive protections for Indigenous peoples as cultural or linguistic minorities or distinctive protections uh, for Indigenous property rights. Of course, the absence in Australia of recognised historic treaties further narrows the field of formal legal lenses through which to view and understand the state Indigenous relationship. And additionally, and perhaps in part because of the lack of these formal frameworks, Common law responses giving shape to the state indigenous relationship have also been, by comparison, very subdued. Instead, laws that benefit or burden indigenous peoples, when challenged, have to run the gauntlet of the Federal Racial Discrimination Act. The RDA, which implements the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, is therefore the default architecture for the evaluation of any law that is specifically directed to an indigenous community. In my view, the shape of the state indigenous relationship that is produced and elaborated by the RDA is, to my mind, quite a distorted one. <laughs> 
In brief, as the law now stands, Australian parliaments may pass laws that single out and uniquely burden Indigenous communities, including by criminalising conduct in those communities that would be legal anywhere else in Australia, and they may do so without seeking or hearing the views of those communities about those laws. The High Court held unanimously in its 2013 decision, Maloney and the Queen, that the imposition by the Queensland Crown of regulatory measures criminalising the possession of certain types and volumes of alcohol in 18 identified Indigenous communities and only in those communities were not racially discriminatory because they were special measures allowed and in fact required by the Racial Discrimination Act because they have the sole purpose of securing the adequate advancement of a disadvantaged racial group. In other words, these laws and others like them are permitted as laws furthering substantive equality through affirmative action. Some judges, to be clear, conceded that special measures as generally contemplated in the Convention and in the Act are ordinarily thought of as measures of the kind that would otherwise be regarded as preferential treatment and therefore confer a, an obvious benefit on the minority group concerned. And they did admit that criminalising the beneficiaries of a special measure did not easily fit within this orthodox rubric. There are many other things to say about that judgment which bear directly on some of the themes that we have addressed in this conference today. But in order to maintain a focus on the Uluru proposals, I uh, propose to uh, attend to the consequences of the High Court not taking up Joan Maloney's uh, invitation to suggest that a special measure that contains criminal sanctions cannot be an exception to racial discrimination unless accompanied by consultation with the beneficiaries. My aim here is to show that the stakes are very high in Australia and that the deficits addressed by the Uluru Statement are current and serious. First, I think it's very important not to lose sight of the fact that when Joe Maloney was arrested on Bookerman, Palm Island community off the coast of Queensland in possession of two bottles of rum and charged in the Townsville Magistrates Court. She was 55 and had no prior criminal record. And she does now, and that is because she is an Indigenous person living in an Indigenous community. Secondly, the decision seems to me to indicate that it is precisely because of their disadvantage and the structure of the RDA that Indigenous peoples are now more vulnerable to unilateral coercive lawmaking than any other community in Australia. Because they are already disadvantaged in the enjoyment of human rights and fundamental freedoms, otherwise discriminatory action can be defended as a special measure when challenged by one of the purported beneficiaries of that measure. And finally, one judge, at least one judge, offered the view that a consultative mechanism was unnecessary in any circumstances with respect to any Australian constituency, given the democratic mechanisms of regular elections and a free press. And this last point brings me to the comparative context in which I suggest we should see the Uluru Statement proposals. And here I'm going to reiterate in short form uh, some features of public law in Canada and New Zealand that have been much more uh, adequately developed by colleagues in other sessions and on other panels. I'm reintroducing them here because we're all together in plenary. So in all three countries, Indigenous peoples are vastly outnumbered by settlers. In Australia, Indigenous people make up about 3% of the national population. The figure in Canada is around 4 and in New Zealand, the figure is around 15%. So Indigenous peoples in all three states face the, the same fundamental challenge of how to be properly heard in the democratic functioning of the state when they are continually at risk of being drowned out by settler majorities, even in matters that directly and uniquely impact on their interests. Canadian New Zealand law has evolved to contain what we might regard as counter-majoritarian mechanisms that support the distinctive historical relationship between states and Indigenous peoples and serve to recognise that this relationship is qualitatively different to the relationship that those states have with their other citizens. And I'll just mention briefly New Zealand's Treaty of Waitangi and Canada's Constitutional Section 35 and the judge-made law on consultation uh, that has developed around those constitutional hooks in both countries. 
the New Zealand Crown is obliged by a legislative reference to the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi to make informed decisions and to consult with Maori, at least on major issues affecting the treaty partnership, as part of its duty to act reasonably, honourably and in good faith in its dealing with its Maori treaty partners. Also in New Zealand, ministers submitting bills to Parliament must draw attention to any implications of the proposed law for the principles of the treaty. And such a requirement ensures that new laws affecting Maori interests are debated by Maori members of Parliament. The current cohort of Maori MPs includes seven elected to the reserved Maori seats and a further 22 or 20, uh, depending on self-identification of those people, elected to general seats across the major political parties. And this figure, uh, for those of you who are good at maths, corresponds to about 24% of the 120 uh, people in the New Zealand Parliament, so well above parity for the Maori population as a whole. These mechanisms invite us to reflect on the particular difficulty Indigenous peoples face in being heard in Australia when they're outnumbered by settlers 33 to 1. Taken together, the consultation requirement, the treaty relationship, including directly negotiated treaty settlements and the Maori seats, set up something that looks to me similar to the national participation and local negotiation proposals expressed in the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Likewise, in Canada, many of you will know that since 1982, there has been a provision in the Constitution that protects Indigenous treaty and property rights. Importantly, Section 35 has formed the basis of a constitutional principle known as the Honour of the Crown, which requires federal and provincial governments to consult with Aboriginal peoples and accommodate their interests where reasonable, even when those interests are premised on rights that are not yet proven, so even where they're responding to an Indigenous claim. At the risk of labouring the point, in Australian law, there is as yet no comparable obligation on Australian governments to consult with Indigenous peoples. All of this to say, it seems to me that in the light of these striking and cascading deficits, the lack of a federal or constitutional bill of rights, the lack of a treaty or treaties, the lack of a common law trust doctrine which could provide a seedbed for consultative obligations, and the High Court's reluctance to find a consultative obligation that would condition the ability of governments to rely on the special measures exception in the Racial Discrimination Act. Given all of these deficits, the Uluru Statement is very understandably an appeal to the Australian people to consider and endorse a relationship of a kind that no branch of our government has so far been willing to pursue on their own account. I want to note in closing that the Uluru proposals are orientated above all else to the maintenance of a just ongoing collaborative relationship and in this sense they're optimistic and forward looking. They're rules of engagement if you like that do not insist on the outcome of those engagements but instead direct us to ways that we can act respectfully and honestly in our dealings with one another. I think what the Canadian and New Zealand examples show, despite periodic missteps as might be expected, that if the process is sound and agreed in advance, the parties can take a leap of faith on substance and outcomes and commit to the process of working through issues as they emerge over time. Finally, and perhaps most fundamentally, implementing the proposal set out in the statement from the heart would go some way to alleviating what is described so effectively in the statement as the torment of powerlessness experienced by Australia's sovereign Indigenous peoples, who are subject to laws that they have had almost no say in making, some of which expressly apply only to them, and many of which are overtly coercive and unusually intrusive. Seen in this context, and given everything that has happened, the statement, I think, is an immensely generous invitation. Thank you. Inga mana, inga waka, inga reo. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. My respects to the traditional 
owners of the land, the Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin nations. I'm going to shift gears a bit from the difficult task of formulating a treaty for the future to the difficult task of applying in the future in law provisions of a treaty negotiated 178 years ago and the implications for judicial review. Now, in the first judicial review proceeding that I heard as a judge, I asked counsel which particular ground of judicial review he, because it was a he, considered strongest. And the adventurous counsel submitted to me for consideration the Mexican food analogy to the grounds of judicial review. As you all know, Mexican food tends to be folded and wrapped in different shapes and arrangements <coughs> and called different dishes, enchiladas, tacos, burritos, quesadillas, or maybe that's Tex-Mex food as well. But really they all contain the same ingredients, flour and water, tomato, cheese, avocado, chili, beans. The same, this council submitted, can be said for the grounds of judicial review. Take your pick, and it's going to be appealed anyway. <laughs> I was not, going to, I was not uh, adventurous enough to put uh, that analogy into my judgment, but he was right. It was appealed. <laughs> and majorities of both the Court of Appeal and Supreme Court disagreed with me about the result of that case, although I hasten to add the score was five judges to four. <laughs> now, I like Mexican food, but I am worried that its analogy with judicial review has substance. The problem with dressing up the same ingredients in random different legal forms is rather more serious in law than it is in the kitchen. It can lead to uncertainty in the law for decision makers who have to abide by it and for those who are trying to assess whether to challenge a decision. Whatever else it means, the rule of law surely requires that litigants challenging and defending an application for judicial review must be able to know what the legal principles are that have to be abided by. Somehow, in my experience, that is not often manifest in practice. Neither counsel nor judges are particularly clear about the grounds for judicial review in New Zealand. Illegality and proper purpose are relevant considerations, relevant considerations, bias, legitimate expectations, substantive unfairness, unreasonableness, or something else. Too often, I worry it is difficult to tell. And that can lead undesirable credence to Philip Joseph's characterization of judicial review in New Zealand as instinctual, which reminded me a little bit of uh, Australia's instinctive synthesis approach to uh, sentencing. So in writing my conference paper, which is on the website but not, uh, I think, in the memory stick, I explore the law of judicial review in relation to one particular area of law I know something about, which is the Treaty of Waitangi in New Zealand. The question I set out to address is how does law and the judicial branch of government contribute to protection of indigenous rights in an essentially political constitutional system? Now first, I should provide some uh, background about the treaty and New Zealand's constitution, which of course was comprehensively explained by Andrew Geddes in one of yesterday's sessions, so I don't need to be uh, as comprehensive as, as I would otherwise be. Uh, the Treaty of Waitangi was signed uh, on behalf of the Crown uh, and then eventually by 530 Māori chiefs or rangatira uh, at Waitangi, first on the 6th of February and then around the country over the rest of the year. There are two versions of the treaty, one in English and one in Māori. There are three simple articles which contain serious linguistic and interpretive ambiguities. In the first article, Rangatira gave to the Crown all the rights and powers, in English, of sovereignty. In Māori, of complete kaunatanga, or governorship. In the second article, the Queen guaranteed to Rangatira the full, exclusive and undisturbed possession of their land, estate, forests and fisheries and other properties, in English. Or, in Māori, of their unqualified exercise of rangatiratanga, or chieftainship. 
In the third article, the Queen guaranteed Māori her protection and imparted to them the rights and privileges in English, or tikanga, or customs in Māori of British subjects. All but 39 rangatira signed the Māori version. The Crown thought it had got sovereignty and proclaimed as much halfway through the process of gathering signatures. As you might be able to see, there is room for disagreement as to what the treaty meant. I won't explain New Zealand's constitutional arrangements in the interest of time. It suffice to say that New Zealand has no written constitution, no supreme law, one small House of Parliament, and an executive primarily constrained by political incentives via the electoral system of proportional representation. So protection of indigenous rights in New Zealand, uh, of Maori <coughs> rights, is ultimately political. But the treaty is still half in and half out of the law. The Waitangi Tribunal was established in 1975 to interpret the two language versions of the treaty and make recommendations about breaches of it. That jurisdiction was made retrospective to, to 1840 in 1985. The primary way in which the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi have legal force is because they are referred to in around 25 acts of the New Zealand Parliament. But as I argued in a book in 2008, the overall effect of the treaty in New Zealand law is incoherent. It is part of New Zealand law for some purpose, purposes and not others. What it means and what effect it has in practice depends on how the judiciary interprets particular laws in the particular factual context in which a case is brought. So here is, here is my question. How does the judiciary contribute to protecting indigenous rights in an ultimately political constitution. In the paper before getting to judicial review, I identified two other answers to that question. I won't dwell on either of these first two. The first, and I think the simplest answer, it lies in the fundamental conventional role of the judiciary in a common law system. To use reason, to decide disputes between individuals or groups of individuals about their legal rights in specific factual circumstances. And it does seem to me that the two things that are, very, that are particularly important about that is that reason is applied and that the law is applied in specific factual contexts. I say more about that in the paper. I also say more in the paper about the second uh, possible answer to my question, and that is that I identify constitutional dialogue as a means by which the judiciary plays a role in contributing to the protection of indigenous rights. I don't dwell on this either at this point. You'll see that in the paper I reiterate suggestions I've made elsewhere uh, for enriching the dialogue metaphor as a descriptive, though not normative, means of understanding constitutional and legal dynamics. That involves identifying the languages or perspectives used by each of the branches of government as well as how loudly each branch is empowered to speak by a constitution. The important point being that the judiciary, using reason and judging specific factual contexts, acts as a cross-check of Parliament's general abstract rules formulated through political negotiation. The paper summarises what I call the reinterpretation of the meaning and status uh, of the Treaty of Waitangi in New Zealand from 1973 to 1993 in terms of the dialogue metaphor. But again, I'll let you read that for yourselves. I want to come to judicial review. The tacos and burritos of my subject. I identify 27 cases which invoke the treaty directly in judicial review proceedings. I'm reasonably confident that my list includes all the cases uh, from the <coughs> Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal. Um, but my list may currently be missing some high court cases which are much more difficult to find. Uh, in addition, I should also note that appeals on the basis of error of law can look effectively like judicial review judgments in substance. After all, illegality for error of law is a ground of judicial review. And I have included those cases in my analysis as well. <coughs> 
The 27 cases of judicial review that rely on the Treaty of Waitangi include cases of great significance to government and to Māori. The 1987 SOE's case deferred the transfer of billions of dollars worth of Crown land and assets in pursuance of the government's program of corporatisation in an election year. And in 2013, the water case could have done the same, but did not, with the partial privatisation of hydroelectricity generation companies, which had been a central plank of the government's election campaign platform the previous year. I do identify patterns in the nature of the decisions under challenge. There are different groups of them. <coughs> the first group, of about 11 judgments, were challenges to the divestment of land and assets that could otherwise be used by the Crown to satisfy Māori treaty claims. The first four, regarding land, forests and coal, from 1987 to 1990, were successful. The next three, regarding broadcasting assets, hydroelectric dams and commercial radio assets, were not successful. Three other challenges later were not successful. You might think the subject matter mattered. And in addition, I think there may have been a difference in whether the court considered in the context in which each case was brought that assist, whether a system of protection over those assets was required <coughs> for the Crown to fulfil its treaty obligations. In another grouping of seven cases from 1987 to 2017, there are challenges of resource management and conservation decisions, and they have often achieved success. Another group of eight judicial review judgments relying on the treaty uh, concerned the process of settling historical treaty grievances, with which the courts are singularly reluctant to get involved, seeing them, I suspect, as primarily political. And finally, and perhaps most constitutionally, uh, there was also a challenge to the Chief Electoral Officer's process of providing Māori with the option of choosing whether to enrol on the Māori electoral roll or the general electoral roll, which occurs every five years. So what are the grounds of challenge? As Dean Knight's book uh, recently has canvassed, grounds of judicial review uh, is, one of, uh, is one of the available schemata by which the law of judicial review can be conceptualised, and I do agree with him that it is the dominant conventional schemata in New Zealand, which means it is important for both potential challengers uh, and potential defenders of challenges to be able to be clear about what the potential grounds of challenge are. So a clear understanding of those grounds, uh, I suggest, is required for the certainty and non-arbitrariness of the rule of law to be maintained. And I find it is a lot harder to identify the grounds on which decisions have successfully and unsuccessfully been judicially reviewed than it is to identify the nature of the decisions involved. As with most judicial reviews, challenges tend to take a kitchen sink approach to pleadings, pleading all the grounds that they can think of and hoping the judge will fish one out of the sink. <coughs> Judges and all themselves are not particularly clear about which grounds they find persuasive. I've tried to categorise the grounds of judicial review in the paper. There's a table uh, which uh, identifies five grounds of judicial review as best I can determine uh, that have been used. Uh, illegality for inconsistency with legislation that affirms the principles of the treaty is the most important one. In addition, failure to consider relevant considerations, legitimate expectations, natural justice and unreasonableness. My conclusions about this pattern of grounds of judicial review uh, is first to note that the primary role of judicial review invokes the Treaty of Waitangi in legislation, which makes sense, because in practice much judicial review is simply statutory interpretation. There's been a lot of work for the judiciary to do in these cases in interpreting the meaning of principles of the treaty, as particularly where Parliament has made bare, unelaborated references to the treaty. But that jurisprudence is now well established and understood as relatively sophisticated and nuanced. A second conclusion about judicial review is that the traditionally neglected ground of unreasonableness has a much bigger role to play in treaty judicial reviews than might be expected. <coughs> 
It's usually the poor cousin, as you all know, uh, in judicial review, and one judge in New Zealand, Justice Hammond, characterized it as the destination of the doomed. <laughs> but reasonableness and unreasonableness pops up regularly throughout the language the courts employ when judicially reviewing decisions in terms of the treaty, and that is because reasonableness on the part of the treaty partners has been found to be part of the substantive requirements of the Treaty of Waitangi. And I refer you to the jurisprudence in the paper. Reasonableness is not a make-weight ground of judicial review in relation to the treaty, that some think it is in judicial review proceedings more generally, because it has been invoked, as interpreted by the judiciary, in the substantive law. Now, I happen to think reasonableness has got a bad rap in administrative law generally, uh, partly because of judicial reticence uh, about uh, how to assess it. And Wensbury's done a lot of damage. I've offered alternatives to that in at least one judgment. Um, but in some ways, I suggest that it's a bit puzzling that judges generally shy away for, from assessing decisions for unreasonableness. Uh, judges are experts in reasons. Providing reasons is core to what we do. Among the reasons, or assessing the reasons given by decision makers is the key task of a judge sitting on appeals. If there is one thing that judges can claim a comparative advantage in vis-a-vis -vis political branches of government, it should be the use and limits of reason. So why should judges not call unreasonableness in administrative decision making when they see it? My third conclusion about judicial review is about the procedural grounds. Uh, I say, try to identify something about them uh, in the paper, uh, but in the short point is that the principles of the treaty are themselves interpreted to be primarily procedural. If the Crown were to fail to take into account a relevant consideration, uh, or breach natural justice or dishonor a legitimate expectation, it would probably be breaching the principles of the treaty. And that flows from court's acceptance of the Waitangi Tribunal's perspective of the treaty as a relational document. The language of partnership is used by the courts. I suggest in the paper that the courts have effectively imported into substantive treaty law the requirements of the law of judicial review, both procedural and also in terms of unreasonableness. So at first, and this is the overall conclusion, I was perplexed uh, by the study which did not yield what I expected it to yield uh, about the law of judicial review. But perhaps uh, what I've examined that suggests a different way of thinking about judicial review more generally. Perhaps inherent in all judicial review is the nature of the substantive law that matters most, whether it emphasizes or plays down the importance of process or invokes or sets its face against unreasonableness, tells us what is fair process and what is unreasonable in the context of that area of law. And finally, in relation to the Treaty of Waitangi, I think it is clear that fair process and substantive unreasonableness have effectively become integrated into the principles of the treaty, and perhaps if that is more fully recognised, counsel can argue more clearly and judges can more clearly apply the law of judicial review when the treaty is invoked. Norera tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Well, we've had a tight timetable, but our speakers have done so well that we have just under 20 minutes left for questions. So please, um, I'm going to throw the floor open for questions. Please indicate if you would like the microphone and do remember to identify yourself and keep your questions nice and short. Uh, Andrew Geddes from the University of Otago. Um, my question's for the Australian participants, and in both of your talks, the question of norms of liberal democracy arose, so the idea of uh, democratic representation and so on, in a couple of different ways. One was in discussing the, uh, the setup of the Representation Commission, 
um, you said it would provide a democratic voice into the process. Uh, now that's interesting because it, it seems to require a certain form that the Commission has to take. And I'm wondering, is that a form that the Aboriginal people themselves want it to, or is that something that the state has mandated, you know, you have to create such a commission? And then, just quickly for Kirsty, uh, you said that Malcolm Turnbull um, basically knocked down the idea of Aboriginal representation in uh, Parliament on the grounds that, you know, no, one, one vote, one person, that's the kind of thing we're going to do. As an outsider looking at Australia, I look at the Senate, and I look at Tasmania, with 2% of the population and 15% of the Senate seats. And it would seem to me that in Australia it would almost be easier to make the claim for dedicated representation than it is, say, in New Zealand. So I'm just wondering how that works. OK, I'll attempt to answer your first part of your question. Um, it's not a state mandate to have a democratic process. Uh, when I spoke earlier about the uh, impacts that colonisation has had on our cultures throughout the country, but southeastern Australia copped the brunt of colonisation. Um, and our cultures, in traditional times, 300 clans, to have a state-based voice is, is, not, is not part of our culture. So my challenge is how do I, in a modern world, where a lot of our traditional practices here in Victoria are not there, how do I marry up a democratic voice that seems to be the only fair and open process that's open to us at the moment? Uh, how do I embed culture aspects of that? Mm. And one of the ways we're looking at exploring that here in Victoria is we will have a, a, a democratically elected representative voice, um, but I will also try to set up an elders council of some sort. So elders, Aboriginal elders play a very vital role in maintaining cultural integrity, maintaining that cultural authority right across all the clans. Uh, and that won't be a democratic elected process. We will try to stay true to traditional cultural aspects of that. And that's something we're looking to set up uh, on top of that representative body. I hope that answers. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. <clears throat> uh, there's, of course, a, a huge difference between a representative body and a legislative assembly. A Turnbull statement presents the proposal as though it is what he calls a third chamber of parliament. So uh, the statement is thought by many, including myself, to be misleading on that point. So that's a partial answer to your question. Uh, but as to your point about staggered representation, it's good. I'm going to put it in my next submission. Thank you. <laughs> yes, up in the middle there. Can you wait for the, the microphone? Let's get it to you as fast as we can. I'm Yelena Grigorievich from Cambridge. I wanted to ask Kirsty, you talked about the need, um, obviously, for constitutional legal rights um, to participation or consultation in the administrative governmental processes, and that obviously um, implies a co-relative duty on the state to allow that, to ensure that that occurs. Do you think at least normatively that that might lead to consideration for a duty or responsibility upon Indigenous peoples themselves to ensure that they are participating, at least for utilitarian or long-term um, purposes? Or do you think that that's actually inconsistent with furthering the interests and autonomy of Indigenous um, peoples from a more deontological perspective? I was wondering which perspective you might take, um, whether there's any tension between the two in any event. Answer. Okay. Uh, well, this is a country that has uh, compulsory voting, so I think that's part of the relevant backdrop. But I take your point, it's very well made. Um, I would say that, uh, that often these issues are couched as uh, an obligation not to withhold reasonable um, cooperation. At least that's something which has been developed in treaty jurisprudence in New Zealand. So it may be uh, more along those lines that it's uh, not so much a, 
a duty which compels Indigenous peoples to act in certain ways, but uh, an obligation to deal with each other reasonably in good faith and in a timely manner when issues of mutual concern arise. Um, I do think there may be something important in framing the obligation to consult as a duty rather than a right. It seems to me that one thing that that does, this is a duty on the part of governments, obviously, is that it puts the onus on governments to ensure that they have found the right people to speak to about the right issue. It takes some of the pressure off Indigenous peoples uh, to consistently reframe and add content to that right by asserting it in every possible opportunity. So that may be something which um, I think might develop as, as we go on with these conversations. Thanks. Yes, here. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I just want to say excellent presentations from all three people and I really enjoyed them. Uh, my question is to Jill. Um, I've noticed in the, uh, in the Advancing the Treaty Process Act, there's no sort of express reference to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and I haven't seen a lot of uh, references to the UN Declaration in, in Hansard or even in the community consultative reports that you see in that EY um, ran in 2016 and 2017. But obviously the, uh, the treaty principles or the framework that's going to guide the, the treaty negotiation framework is, is imbued or with, with uh, underwritten principles or underwritten norms and values. And so I'm just wondering if you can reflect a little bit on the role the Declaration is playing uh, in, in communities. Is, is it being used uh, or sort of just are the values being used, I guess, without the UNDRIP expressly being uh, stated? Yes. Just before you answer, could I get the microphone to go back up to the back of the room so we can take the next question immediately? Uh, very much so. Uh, the, uh, um, uh, the UN Declaration provides a lot of guidance for the past, to us as Aboriginal people, for the past two years, a working group has been established. Part of our principles as a working group is the UN Declarations. Um, uh, at some stage there with the bill, there was conversation as whether the UN Declarations could be enshrined in the legislation. Um, but it wasn't practical. So, but to answer your question, the, the declaration guides us as Aboriginal people 100% of the time. Fully committed to uh, those de that declaration. So there's a question in the very back row, yeah. Uh, thank you all very much. Matthew Stubbs from Adelaide Law School. Um, two very short questions. Uh, one treaty or many, and does it matter that the Commonwealth is not at the table right now? I think that one's for you, Jill. Okay. Um, uh, it does matter that the Commonwealth's not at the table. In an ideal world, you would have all levels of government at the table when negotiating treaties, uh, state, Commonwealth and local, by the way. Uh, we all know that the Commonwealth's not at the table um, and we're not sure when they will be at the table. But us as Aboriginal people in Victoria are prepared to explore what a state-based treaty could, what outcomes could be benefit to us as Aboriginal people that live within Victoria. Could I, could I add something to that, Adrian? If we have to ask. Yeah. So uh, one of the interesting things about the development of the Australian Federation that perhaps distinguishes it from Canada and from the US is that the federal government was excluded from this realm of lawmaking, laws that applied to Indigenous peoples until 1967. I'm sure a lot of you know that. Uh, to my mind, that is significant somehow. It does seem to suggest that the primary relationship, which is organised around land, which is part of the powers of the states, does vest with the states or has historically. That may make uh, sense that perhaps this is a ground-up movement. It starts with the states and then the Commonwealth um, can join in in its own terms. Um, uh, and I think that that's possibly what the Makarata Commission was, was mentioned in the earlier statement. That's possibly the, the sort of inductive method that the authors of that statement had in mind. It's just a thought. Um, hello, Nicole Rowan, University of Auckland. My question is for Matthew. Um, uh, so I was provoked by your suggestion. I think I was supposed to be provoked by the suggestion that judges are, of course, experts and considering reasonableness, because after all, judges uh, deal in reasons. And 
I agree with that as far as it goes, but it raises the question, uh, of course, whether or not a reason counts as a reason at all if it's a bad reason. Um, and I wondered whether you would be willing to reflect or are able to reflect on whether you think judges are well-placed in this context, particularly, considering um, uh, various forms of uh, partnership and other implications of indigenous state relationships uh, as to whether or not, you know, judges are, uh, are well placed to consider good reasons versus not good reasons. And I know that raises all sorts of difficulties. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think they do it uh, often. I think uh, when you look at um, judicial reviews which come up, uh, in essence, more often than not, the question being asked is, what is, is what the decision maker did reasonable uh, in this space? Uh, whether it's um, uh, a degree of preference to be accorded to uh, a tribe which is objecting to uh, a competing whale watching license being uh, granted uh, or something similar which has happened more recently in Auckland. Um, in making decisions about those sorts of questions and importantly, making decisions about those questions in the context of specific factual situations, uh, I think quite often the judges are already making uh, judgments about reasonableness. And uh, that actually reflects my experience of the rest of what we do. Quite often you're doing that in other cases as well, in private law. Um, so, yes. Time for one or two more. There's a question just up the back. Yes, thank you. Um, hello. Um, the third speaker reminded us about the mismatch of understanding between the Maori and English versions of the Treaty of Waitangi. And Kirsty, um, you spoke about the lack of historic treaties in Australia as being part of what has um, narrowed the scope of um, relations between Indigenous people and the state. I was interested in asking the question whether, on the other hand, the lack of historic treaties in Australia has something of a silver lining in the sense that um, the scope of future treaties um, could be um, something more shared, a, a more shared understanding and... and um, acknowledge things that perhaps haven't been acknowledged in historic treaties? Oh, I think that's a great point. Uh, the historic treaties in all of the countries we've been discussing in this panel are quite different creatures than uh, the contemporary treaties, for example, that are being negotiated in British Columbia, uh, much less detailed, cover far less ground. So I think your intuition uh, may be correct. It may be that uh, that a contemporary treaty could be more reflective of current Indigenous aspirations. Uh, so it's a point well made. Thank you. Did you want to add something, no. Joe? No. Okay. Well, we have time for one more. Up the very back, yes. Hi. Um, thanks, Jill, for reminding us of the importance of elders' councils in this whole um, discussion around representation. Um, it brings a lot, uh, back into the four um, questions about self-determination in, in particular and how, uh, how people choose to make their voices heard. In the ACT, we've got an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elected body that was established in about 2008, but of course our Nunawal Elders Council predates that um, by some years. Got me thinking, if we're now looking at a, and obviously there's lots of, lots of different things going on around the country, um, and the idea that those bodies can work together. Um, I suppose my, my question is, if we're now looking at an, a nationwide um, scheme for representation, and for people to have their voices heard. Are there moves afoot? And my question is really one of ignorance on, on this. Um, so, uh, are there moves afoot to, to have a, a sort of elders council on the national sphere um, in addition or, you know, if we're not going to end up 
uh, in the immediate future with um, with the sort of uh, voice to parliament type of thing is are there other things that are coming up um, along that sort of elders council um, line? I don't know what's been um, negotiated or been discussed at the Commonwealth level. Um, I have no idea. I was heavily involved in the crafting and the development of the Uluru Statement. Um, but I've been busy with what's happening in Victoria, so I haven't kept my eye on the ball there. But I think it's important that, as I said earlier on, we're developing a, um, a construct that is not familiar to our cultures. Um, so how, the, the challenge for us as Aboriginal people, whether there's going to be a, uh, a voice to parliament at the national level, I believe we've got to ensure that we do as much as possible embed an elder's voice to work within that structure. Um, what we're hoping here in Victoria is, and I mean, I don't make these decisions, what's going to happen here in Victoria. I actually have, for the first time ever, to my knowledge, and I've been alive 62 years, um, have we ever held a Victorian Aboriginal Elders Forum? So the Commission is holding an Elders Forum on the 24th of September. And the purpose of that forum is to get guidance from the elders um, as to how can I embed uh, the cultural aspects uh, of our way of doing business into a modern day construct such as a statewide representative body that's gonna be democratically elected. Uh, so I'm hoping to get a lot of guidance. So if we're successful here, I'm hoping that we can lead the nation. They can look at what's happened here. Uh, and either mirror it, adapt it, but run with it. So that's all I've got to add on that one. I hope that sort of attempted to answer your question. Well, I said that was the last question, but Jason Veruis wants to make an intervention, and in this context, I can't say no. <laughs> Jason. Yeah, I just couldn't help but ask Matthew a, que a further question about his paper in Judicial Review uh, in, in New Zealand. And you, you enumerated a number of grounds on which uh, the courts have relied uh, where the treaty's been uh, relevant. Is there another particular ground or some other grounds which you think hold out the potential for bringing the treaty into judicial consideration? And, and or is there another ground which you think it might, uh, treaty principles might spur uh, the development of at common law, and I'm thinking perhaps of uh, duties of consultation, for example, where policy proposals uh, affect uh, Maori in particularly. That might be another paper, I think, Jason. Um, I, I don't, I don't, have not identified an additional ground that should be added. Uh, I think we've got too many grounds already. And I think they only need to be rationalised into about three. Um, but uh, that, that's actually the paper that I've got next to, to do. And in relation to policy, um, I mean, courts are usually hesitant to legalise the policy-making process, and I think there's good reason for that. All right, thank you. Let me draw this to a close uh, by thanking the speakers. These papers addressed a question that is legally complex and... Uh, politically urgent and goes to really fundamental questions of justice and so we're especially grateful to you for all of the clarity that you have lent to them through your papers today. Please join with me in thanking the speakers. <laughs>